In the years following World War I, the railroads of America were finding themselves with more freight to move than most such companies were prepared for. In the short term, railroads cope with the lengthening trains by wrangling in more than one locomotive, which meant more money spent on more power, more employees, and more structural upkeep to keep the massive fleet of engines maintained. To the Union Pacific Railroad, though, the best solution was one engine for each train. With freight trains getting longer and heavier, though, moving that much tonnage was going to take muscle, and the UP wasn't going to stop at anything to get their goods delivered. Gone were the days of dragging heavy loads at low speeds. As trucking was becoming a competitor, faster, not so much more tonnage, was the name of the game. Coming out of the Great Depression, the most powerful machine was the largest single-unit engine of its time. The 9000 class moved with 12 drive wheels in one group, and with a third cylinder for added oomph. While this type of engine served well on the plains, where rails curved gently, the stiff-legged 9000s were much harder on the tight curves through the mountain passes like Sherman Hill in Wyoming and the Wasatch Mountains in Utah. Although faster than its predecessors, both their stiffness and their third cylinders made them a headache for both operating and backshop crews. The task of building a better locomotive would fall to UP's motive power department. One solution to the stiff-leggedness was to split the locomotive's frame in half, and have them joined by a hinge pin in the middle so the locomotive could bend itself around tight curves. UP had previously tried the so-called articulated type of engine in the 1910s, which were slow movers and tended to pound the track with their exhaust beat. A seemingly simple revision to the concept was devised. Instead of using the steam twice, first through the rear pair of cylinders and through the front, this new engine would use steam through four equal-sized cylinders simultaneously, which freed up the engine's reciprocating mass and, by extension, its top speed. When the first of the new articulators rolled out from the erecting hall in the summer of 1936, they sported some of the most modern features in steam locomotion, like circulators in the firebox to help boil water evenly over 83 square feet, and roller bearings on all axles for a smooth ride over long distances. Much was expected out of this new engine, as a test run was laid out with a fully loaded train in Ogden, Utah, to be run eastward over 150 miles at track speed to Green River, Wyoming, where the engine would turn back to Ogden with another loaded train. This was going to be a challenge for any locomotive, which was why UP Vice President William Jeffers dubbed them Challengers. Within 10 years, 105 Challengers were roaming throughout the UP system. They could hustle a 20-car passenger train at 70 miles per hour, or over 100 freight cars on the long grades. Locomotive engineers and firemen admired how, for its size, the Challengers rode smoothly and were incredibly well-balanced even at high speeds. Beyond UP's rails, other railroads were taking note. Challengers were soon being ordered by the Rio Grande, Northern Pacific, Western Pacific, Western Maryland, and the Delaware and Hudson. With their great power and flexibility, most railroads had concurred that the Challenger was going to be the ultimate steam locomotive. But at the end of the decade, war was looming. Even more freight than ever would have to be moved to aid in the fighting, and trains in the UP were projected to be as heavy as 3,600 tons. The Challenger could handle this tonnage with ease on the flats, but would be defeated at any of the mountain passes and require a helper locomotive to make the grade. At a time when UP needed as much power as they could to move as many trains as they could, the railroad elected to stretch the Challenger concept to its maximum. Arriving in August of 1941, the locomotive that would come to be known as Big Boy would be one of the largest in the world, and among the most powerful. Twenty-five of these engines would be drafted in to pick up the slack through the mountains. In many ways, the officially termed 4000s complemented their smaller siblings with the newer 3900s borrowing many of their cosmetic family resemblances. 4000s were found primarily across the Rocky Mountains, particularly around Sherman Hill with the steepest grades. While one of them would be tried out on the Los Angeles and Salt Lake line, the 3900s would rule across the entire network between Omaha, Portland, and Los Angeles. Together, they delivered the goods to aid in America's victory. 
After the war, there was a shift in policy. Diesel electric power was largely taking over moving passengers, and was now starting to prove itself in freight service too. This form of power was not only more cost efficient and much less labor intensive than steam, but their decreased need for attention allowed for trains to operate for longer distances and therefore shorten travel times. But even at this early stage, diesel power had its limitations. On average, a typical mainline diesel locomotive could only muster up to 1500 horsepower, requiring additional units that would be electrically operated together via multiple unit control. To match the power and strength of the challengers and big boys that they were replacing, these units would have to be imbued into groups of four, five, or six units. With that much power, trying to keep trains over 3,000 tons moving through the mountains, with hard acceleration also factored in, the electric transmissions were often overwhelmed with high amperage as neighboring railroads were discovering. Union Pacific believed that the source of trouble was in the amount of parts and control assemblies that was going through this much stress out on the road, and this led to UP believing that maintenance costs were tied to the number of units on one train rather than the units themselves. So UP set out to design a locomotive that could produce the same amount of power as their steam-breathing predecessors. Before World War II, UP had worked with General Electric on producing two steam electric turbine locomotives. With lessons learned from their short-lived lifespans, GE's creation would be designated as the Gas Turbine Electric Locomotive, or GTEL. In place of the conventional diesel engine, a gas turbine engine would supply power to the generator that could power the engine's traction motors for movement. Rolling out from GE's plant in 1949, the first generation of these GTELs could put out 4,500 horsepower, or about two-thirds the power of the big boy. On paper, these units would be more efficient than either diesel or steam engines because of fewer moving parts, therefore making them easier to maintain. In fact, as the big boys, challengers, and other large steam engines would be retired, their tenders would be salvaged and repurposed to carry extra Bunker C oil to extend the turbine's range. Because of that, turbines were free to roam the entire UP system. The most developed GTEL model was introduced in 1958 and was spread out over three units. The leading A unit contained the standard diesel engine, used for powering auxiliary equipment like the exciter and air compressor, and for moving around freight yards at slow speeds. The middle B unit contained the gas turbine itself, along with the main generator, to convert the kinetic energy to electricity, enough to power the traction motors on both units. The fuel tender would supply 24,000 gallons of Bunker C oil to extend the GTEL's range. This unit measured 83 feet from coupler to coupler and could produce a staggering 8,500 horsepower from just the gas turbine alone. That would make this the most powerful locomotive on Earth at that time. UP would put them in their best element, too, leading long-distance, high-speed freight trains across the vast, isolated stretches of main line in the West. But this is the thing with turbines. They operate at their best at a constantly high RPM, and there are very few places in the North American rail system where trains can operate flat out at high speeds. At low speeds, these units were fuel hoggers. Although Bunker C oil was cheap at first, the oil was found to be of use in manufacturing plastics, which drove up the price. For a time, an earlier version of the GTEL was experimentally fueled with propane, which did burn cleaner with reduced wear at the expense of heightened safety measures and complex operating procedures. At any speed, though, the railroaders still had to put up with an all-new array of mechanical issues, and the biggest issue of all... The noise level. The nickname, Big Blows, came from complaints from trackside residents about the loud exhaust drone from the gas turbines, which had them completely banned from the greater Los Angeles area. There were even incidents where the turbines generated so much heat that when idling underneath a street overpass, the asphalt would melt. GE tried marketing the gas turbine type to other railroads, but UP would be the one and only buyer. By the time the last units were retired in 1969, it was not uncommon to see a turbine being helped along by one or two diesel locomotives, as they were being overcome by train lengths and weights. But the Big Blow's departure would leave a void in UP's power structure. The railroad still believed that having a small fleet of large engines, as opposed to having a large fleet of small engines, was still the best way to move freight over their network. 
UP's goal has shifted the running trains with three unit last ships worth 1500 horsepower altogether. While other railroads felt complacent with lashing their diesel units up, UP put out a seemingly modest request for a proposal for the three locomotive builders. EMD went above and beyond for UP's offer with four units. In between two standard GP35s were two monstrous B units classified as the DD35. These units came with two diesel prime movers united on one frame, producing 5,000 horsepower. In 1965, when the writing was on the wall for the GTELs, UP initially ordered 25 of these boosters. After deciding that they liked these units, UP asked for another 15 with cabs added, creating the DDA-35. At the same time, General Electric produced its answer to UP's request with the largest locomotive in their Universal Series range, the U-50s. These units bore several similarities to their EMD counterparts, while trying to be more economical by incorporating parts from the old GTEL turbines. Two versions were produced the Spartan U-50 riding on four treks with span bolsters, and the U-50C with three axle treks and its engines directed inward to create a centralized radiator section. Alco's offering was called the C-855. Although this ABA last up was the largest offering in its century lineup, it was also the shortest lived, with their frames cracking as a result of its rushed production. The U-50s were not immune to serious issues too. The three-axle variation suffered engine fires from its aluminum wiring and cracks forming in the trucks from fatigue. A downturn in business had these units sidelined in 1976, after just seven years of service. The units that would endure would be the EMDs. Before the decade was out, UP came back to EMD for another order of double diesels, but with a few modifications. At 98 feet long and with 6,600 horsepower, the resulting DDA-40X would become the largest single-unit diesel locomotive in the world. They were nicknamed Centennials, in reference to commemorating 100 years since completing the first transcontinental railroad. Within three years, 47 Centennials would be roaming the UP system. They weren't just powerful, but also groundbreaking. The X in the engine's designation was for experimental, with EMD using this engine as a testbed for some of their cutting-edge technologies, like the brand new 645 type prime mover, modular electrical components, and a new type of low test circuit for troubleshooting errors. These features would be incorporated in many of EMD's future offerings, branded as the Dash 2 line, helping them to maintain their lead in the horsepower race. Operating crews admired their responsiveness, speed, and smoothness, earning EMD credibility that would only get stronger over the next decade. The Centennials would soldier on to rack up 22,000 miles of revenue service every month for 15 years. The last recorded revenue run of a Centennial was in 1984, with most of them having served over 2 million miles in service. From that day forward, UP would use the same motive power as every other railroad. Today's trains are powered mostly by conventional diesel-electric engines, usually with as much as 4,500 horsepower in each unit. With this much horsepower together, they can pull exponentially the amount of tonnage that their predecessors would have been able to handle. In total, the UP Superpower family is survived by two Challengers, eight Big Boys, two GTELs, and 20 Centennials, but no DD35s nor any of the earlier turbines. UP themselves still retains two of their steam giants in their heritage fleet, Challenger 3985 and Big Boy 4014 along with Centennial 6936. Although most of the survivors are relegated to the sightings and display tracks, the know-how that was gained from the building and operation of these engines would lay down the groundwork for today's heavy haul locomotives, which continues the never-ending job of moving freight. Mm -hmm.